All right, Canice 310. This is spring 2021. Dr. Campbell here, uh, your your content instructor, and uh, I'm here to help. But uh, we, we, you need to help me help you, okay? So we're going to talk about a few things, and then we'll go over the test. Uh, but first thing I would like to discuss is putting into perspective things you have and things that you don't have. So obviously with the uh, pandemic and the need to go virtual, it's put us all in, in a different phase that we have to adjust to and get through, me included. Um, however, there are some positives of this, and I need you guys to at least hear what I'm about to say and understand that uh, when I teach in person before the lockdown, there was no recorded lectures. Like you had to be in class and I didn't post lectures online. So if you weren't there, you didn't get the lecture. And for exams, students didn't have open book. <laughs> students didn't have access to notes. They had to come in knowing all that stuff. And I remember when I was in fourth grade, uh, I had my first open book test in science. And she announced it. She's like, you can have an open book test on Friday. And having that open book test knowledge, knowing that it was open book, um, I didn't prepare as much as I probably should have because I was like, oh, it's open book. All the stuff's going to be in the book. And I failed it. And so I think that I'm not speaking to all of you. And I am speaking to some of you because I get asked a lot, how can I improve? Can you help? Can you give me some advice? How can I improve? So what I'm telling you isn't like a, a, a lecturing, you know, wagging my finger and pointing. No, this is my way of trying to follow up with students that genuinely want to improve. Okay. So the number one way we can improve is to not go into a test unprepared or relying on your notes because this material isn't necessarily 100% memorization like other classes. This is conceptual understanding, especially those illusions. Another thing that kind of gets in our way of progress for some of you, I mean, I have some students who are having no problems. They're, they're making A's. You don't practice being an engineer until you go through engineering school. But in the area of human movement, we have a lot of students who practice being experts in human movement, whether it's, you know, exercising yourself or reading magazines and personal training. So we have a lot of practitioners of human movement that have not yet been higher educated. And what I mean by higher educated is college educated in human movement, okay? And so sometimes you can have my, what my coach used to call bad habits. You can have misunderstandings of things that you thought, that you heard, that you read. And all of a sudden, this guy with a PhD in biomechanics from Auburn, from Delcom, Louisiana, comes and says, no, 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 that motion is actually not happening at the ankle. And your instinct is to say, well, I've always heard it was happening at the ankle. You kind of see what I'm, I'm trying to get to here. I'm, I, um, you know, so, so we have to be open-minded. We have to ask questions. You know, let's say I tell you something that, hey, this subtalar joint motion is not happening at the ankle. And you're like, ah, I just, I still don't get it. That's when you text me. 24 seven office hours. If I'm up and you're up and if I'm available and you're available, let's talk it through. Let's try to get on the same page. I'd rather talk to you while you're studying it and it's fresh on your mind than putting it off a whole day. I, I wanna try to clarify your questions when you have the questions, okay? So that's why I have that. 24 and some students take advantage of it I, I, and those students perform 
well. Okay? So we have to have an open mind. So what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, also, one more thing, and I'm not saying that's, you know, I'm just being honest. I use last semester's lectures, like I said, because last semester's grades were outstanding. I, we had an 80 overall average in the class. But just because I use last semester's lectures does not mean I use last semester's exams. And so there may be, I'm not saying there is, but there may be some of you that got some screenshots or some text, you know, now I can't police who's, you know, kind of taken my academic integrity at home. I, I can't police it. But you have to understand, guys, that I'm going to mix some stuff up. You know, on, on last semester's test, I might ask right transverse, and then this, this test, I might ask less transverse. It may be the same picture, but I'll ask a different question. I'm testing your understanding. Some people say my questions are tricky, and they can be if you don't understand it. You know, if I took uh, a, an exam on, on, on Latin, it would be super tricky for me because I don't understand Latin. Trickiness is a function of your understanding of the material. I can't be tricked in a math test. And we also have to look at students who perform well. If it was tricky, there wouldn't be any students that perform well. Every question would kind of be a toss up, right? So it's possible, guys. We just have to put in a little more work. And I think it can be explained again because these exams, unlike past years, are open book, open resource. And why do I do that? Because I can't police it. So I'd rather have everybody have access than say, okay, guys, no open book, knowing a few students are going to be honorable and do it, but I can't police everybody. So I'll let you have at it. The trade-off of that, I personally feel, is that students aren't preparing as stringently as in the past. And there's a reason for it. You know, we, we've been cramped up. We've been, you know, subjected to this new learning style. And that's why I do things like post my lectures in advance. And that's why I did shift my grading scale. And that's why I am letting you take exams with open notes and open books. However, that trade-off could be a lack of urgency to prepare knowing that you have all of that stuff. So again, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this isn't to, uh, again, wag a finger at you. It's to genuinely try to help. If we can kind of acknowledge maybe what some of the issues are, uh, we can try to improve our grades. I can work with improvement, ladies and gentlemen. If you made D's on the first two tests, but you pop B's and A's on the next two, I can work with that. But I can't work with four F's. I, I can't. I can't work with four straight low D's. Can't work with that. I can work with improvement. Okay. So what I'm going to do right now is unprecedented. Because again, I, I thought about it last night and I can't police it. So some of you probably already have these questions and, and going to share them with other people. So I'm like, you know what? Who cares? Then, then let, let's let's roll and rock with it. And uh, maybe I can help others. All right. So let's go over this test. What I'm going to do is explain what the answer is. And on some of the questions, I might go over some commonly missed like uh, and, and, and talk about why. OK. How many normally functioning vertebra contribute to trunk flexion? Normally functioning, you know why I put that? Because someone may be like, well, what about someone with a uh, fused vertebra, right? So just normal function. Well, as per my lecture, cervical is cervical. I can move my neck independent of my thoracic and lumbar, but trunk is a combination of thoracic and lumbar. So then all you gotta do is add up how many thoracic, how many lumbar? You got 12 thoracic and five lumbar. 12 plus 5 is 17. Okay? And I think I just confirmed it on my fingers. I got to confirm it on my fingers, you know? All right, let's see the next one. All right. Okay, let's look at the question first. Wait, let me get the zoom out.
All right, not every question is going to be a three foot putt because I need to challenge students that are really working hard to understand this stuff. And, and I need to see where, you know, if I, if I gave an easy test and half of the class made hundreds, man, that's awesome. But not for me, because I, I, I don't know how, you know, how much they really know if they all made hundreds. So there's going to be some, some questions that are going to be on, you know, the higher end of understanding. But I gave these examples in class. If you watch the lectures, you'll get these questions. So here's the deal. From the starting position in the above photo, this person then undergoes left transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Identify the motion at the right hip. Okay. What I'd like for you to do is imagine this person, just half of him. Okay. You got to use your imagination. But it's going to help to, 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 to understand. Pretend that his left hip isn't there and all you see is his right hip and he was in one of those hip abductor, horizontal ab and abductor machines, you know, like the Jane Fonda stuff where you're sitting down and your legs go. We had a question about that uh, in my, my uh, other class. So my point is, is if he was magically in that position on the machine and he moved his leg out here, this is his pelvis, this is his hip. You'd say right horizontal abduction, right horizontal adduction, all day, every day, right? So we can move the femur about the socket, but in this position, we can move the socket about the femur. And you'd have the same motion from here to there or from there to there. It's the same thing from here to there. Freeze it. It's the same thing. Here to there, here to there. So that's right hip horizontal abduction. Okay. Some of you still may not understand what's right and left. And that's first test material. And if you don't understand what's right and left, I could see why you missed a lot of questions. We always analyze motion from the person that we are observing's perspective. His right leg is on the ground and his left knee is on the floor. I've said this several times in, you know, if a, a surgeon has to operate and, and amputate the right leg, if he's looking down on the person, he may cut off the wrong leg. Who's right? His right? My right? So we always default to the person who we are analyzing. And that's not new information. It may be new information for those that, that, that didn't absorb it in the first lecture. But it's important information. His right foot is on the ground. His left knee is on the ground. Now, would his left hip be internally rotating? Absolutely. That's not the question. The question was, identify the motion at the right hip, horizontal abduction. There's his femur. Here's his pelvis, horizontal abduction. All right, beat that dead horse. Let's see what we got next. I'm standing on my left leg. Standing on my left leg with my right knee flexed, right foot off the ground. My left leg is in anatomical position. I proceed to undergo right lateral pelvic girdle rotation. My left hip must have done what? Left hip adduction. Yeah. Hey, this is driving me crazy. So, left hip adduction. So, I'm standing on my left leg. I, I got to use your imagination here, guys. Left leg. This is Mr. Pelvis. See him smiling at you? Standing on my left leg. Adduction. Adduction. 
right lateral pelvic girdle rotation, like Mr. Pelvis would be rolling off to the right. Adduction. Okay, the question is, which hip had no, which hip had no effect on pelvic girdle rotation from left picture to right picture and what motion occurred at the trunk during this to compensate? That right leg had nothing to do with the pelvic girdle rotation. She can flex it, extend it, abduct it, adduct it. That pelvis isn't going anywhere until that left hip does it. Okay, Doom. because of this, her trunk recurves as the pelvis rotates to her left. Unless she wants all of her upper extremity to go along for the right, she has to recurve her trunk back to the right. Left lateral pelvic, right lateral trunk. Left lateral pelvic, right lateral trunk. How many individual bones make up the left hip? Well, the femur is one. And the acetabulum is the socket, but the acetabulum, as per lecture, is made up of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. So four, three that make up the socket, one that makes up the ball. Ah, it was on this test. So look, you could see how her right hip is like the other guy's right hip, right? It's just not on the ground. So that's horizontal A, B, and A deduction. So instead of moving the femurs in the other example, the femur stayed fixed and you move the pelvis. Still horizontal A, B, and A deduction from the hip's perspective. Which specific hip motion would occur if she brought her knees closer together in this example? Bilateral hip horizontal adduction. I even use pictures from the lectures, screenshots. This specific example was given in class lecture. Per that lecture and this specific example, identify the positions of my right and left hips respectively. I even went respectively. You should know what respectively is. But however, I even said, hey, right hip answer, then left hip answer, just in case. All right. My right hip, my right hip. Where you, the person you're analyzing, my right hip is abducted, and my left hip is in anatomical position. The illusion, remember the four types of motion, looks like it's moving and it is, looks like it's not moving and it's not, looks like it is moving and it's not, looks like it's not moving and it is. Looks like it's not moving and it is. Looks like it's moving and it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot force you to see this. You have to either practice until you see it, like riding a bike, or contact me to help you find other examples to help you see this. But it's in the videos. This exact example is in the video lecture that I gave on this test. Is that tricky? Is it tricky that I showed you exactly 
the answer to this question on your video? Help me help you. From left to right, what would be the motion of her hip that made this pelvis rotate, responsible for pelvic girdle rotation? Motion of the hip. Well, what made that pelvis go left lateral pelvic girdle rotation was her right, her left hip abducting. So left hip abduction. And what is the rotation of the pelvis? Left lateral. Left lateral pelvic girdle rotation because of left hip abduction. Right hip had nothing to do with it. What is the obvious position of my trunk? Let's see if Mr. Box Pelvis can help us out. Here's Mr. Box Pelvis looking right at you, just like my pelvis is looking right at you. And then here is Mr. Umbrella with a hook at the end that represents my nose, my schnoz. My nose isn't looking at you, or I tell you what, better than my nose because I can move my neck. Let's go with sternum because that's what I used in the lecture. So this is Mr. Sternum. You do not see Mr. Sternum. You see Mr. Pelvis looking at you. The anterior part of the pelvis is looking right at you. But Mr. Sternum is facing the ground. So how can... Mr. Pelvis be looking at you and Mr. Sternum be looking at the ground if I'm right transverse trunk rotated. That's how. They're both looking at you like anatomical position. Right transverse trunk rotated can have Mr. Pelvis looking at you. Hello. And Mr. Sternum looking at the ground. One way to prove this is, well, how would, if I kept this position, right, Mr. Sternum looking at the ground, Mr. Pelvis looking at you, how would I have to rotate Mr. Sternum to go back to anatomical? I'd have to spin him to the left to go back home. Therefore, I'm spun to the right in this position. No one said human movement was easy. It takes work. But the more you work at it, the easier it'll get. I promise you, you just gotta grind. You gotta grind, you gotta grind through these illusions um, because it'll make you better healthcare professionals, fitness trainers, coaches because of it. You gotta love that word specific. In the lecture, I emphasize that the knee is a modified hinge joint. It's similar to other hinge joints, but it does something they cannot do. And that is when that knee is unlocked, it can rotate in its transverse plane. Fingers can't do that. Ankle can't do that. Elbow can't do that. Okay. Modified hinge joint. Straight, straight from the notes and straight from the book uh, lectures. And some of you may say, well, why is that question important? It's really important if we're going to understand the motion at the knee. In other words, if you think that the knee is a hinge joint and it can only do two motions, how in the world are you going to get the internal and external rotation questions if you don't understand that what makes that allowable is that it's modified to allow rotation when I'm flexed? Straight from the lecture. Straight from the lecture. I rotate my pelvis so that the pumpkin goes from looking to your right to looking at you. I stop in anatomical position. Now, notice when you're like, well, Dr. Campbell, that's kind of confusing. Now, all of a sudden, it's my perspective. Yeah, because I'm talking about a pumpkin. I'm trying to help you see because clothing can sometimes be kind of getting in the way unless you really practice this stuff enough. Well, then it doesn't get in the way. But I'm saying, hey, man, the pumpkin is looking to your right, and then the pumpkin start, looks right at you. What would that motion be? I rotate my pelvis so that the pumpkin goes from looking to your right to looking at you. I stop in anatomical hip position. What would the pelvic girdle rotation be, and what motion would be happening at my right hip? 
right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, right hip internal rotation. How do I know that it is internal rotation? Because that right hip is externally rotated. Look at that. Here's Mr. Pelvis looking over here. And here is, let's say, the hook represents my foot. I'm externally rotated. If I fixed it and came back, you'd see my foot is pointing out. So when I come back here, I have to internally rotate to go back to anatomical position. External, internal, external, internal. But that was all explained in the lecture. Here's another illusion question that I told you guys was coming. Cutting and planting. Her left knee position would be flexed and externally rotated. Her toes, think of her kneecap right there, right? Think of her kneecap as kind of being her pelvis. I mean, her pubis. Her toes are flared out. They're flared laterally. They're pointing out relative to her kneecap. And the only way you could do that, if you take your foot off the ground and you flex your knee and say, how can I get my toes to point lateral to my kneecap? You have to externally rotate. Straight from the lecture. Identify the joint position of the right ankle and right hip. Hmm. There's clues here. Which one's right? I don't know. Well, it's his right. Also, I see the shadow cast with his knee on the ground, and that's closer to you than his other foot. So I know that his right foot is on the ground and his left knee is on the ground. Identify the joint positions of the right ankle and right hip. His right ankle is dorsi flexed, and his right hip is flexed. You are driving, you take your foot off the gas and then press on the brake while keeping your he uh, heel on the floorboard. Which ankle motions would you most likely occur to prefer this task? Dorsi flexion to take your foot off the gas and then plantar flexion. To, um, take your foot off the gas and then press on the brake. Dorsi flexion, foot off the gas, plantar flexion, press on the brake. All right, from this position, she comes up. She comes up, okay? From this position, she brings her upper body up using motion at her hips. Man, I even added, I, I never used to add that kind of extra uh, clues to the other classes. But I'm trying, I'm really trying. So the only way she's going to come up is if she has posterior pelvic girdle rotation because of hip extension. Posterior pelvic girdle rotation and bilateral hip extension. Once again, straight from the lectures, I go from this position in the above photo back to anatomical position, select one, okay? And all the answers are lateral or pelvic girdle rotations and hip motion. Guys, here's a bit of advice. You can answer every single one of these questions without, well, it could be fill in the blank. Like, in other words, I don't even look at the answers. I, I, obviously, I gotta go to the question. Photo back to anatomic position, select one. Okay, I'm not looking specifically. I'm just saying he's asking me pelvic girdle rotation and hip motion. Like I'm not paying attention to left lateral, left transverse. You know, that's going to confuse me. He wants pelvic girdle rotation, hip motion. Let me analyze. Coming back from anatomical, okay? That would be left lateral pelvic girdle rotation. His right, my right hip is abducted in the start position. And then when I come back to anatomical, I'm back home. So if I go from abducted to back home, I have to adduct to get there. 
So left lateral pelvic girdle rotation and right hip adduction. Once again, adding more information to help you guys out. From anatomical position, I go to the above photo. The above photo is my finished position. If it helps, pretend I'm reaching down to grab a bucket handle from the floor. Identify the motion of the pelvis and the trunk in this photo. The pelvis is right lateral. So I have right lateral pelvic girdle rotation. And if I'm trying to pick up something from the floor, I don't want to cancel out that right lateral by moving my trunk to the left because that's going to get my hand further from the floor. If I'm trying to pick up something from the floor, I want a summate motion. I want to go left lateral pelvic and, I'm sorry, I want to go right lateral pelvic and right lateral trunk so that I can grab from the, from the ground, okay? So from anatomical position, I go to the above photo. My pelvis has right lateral pelvic. My trunk has right lateral trunk. Summate motion so that I could get whatever I'm trying to get off the, off the floor. All right, I was in anatomical hip pelvis position and then rotated my pelvis to the position in the photo. Identify the pelvic girdle rotation as well as the motion of the left hip to get me to the above photo position. Okay, let's check out Mr. Pelvis. Anatomical, looking at you. Here, left transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Motion of the left hip. That's my left hip. Notice how my left hip in this new position, my toes, let me try it this way. My toes are not lateral. My toes are pointing in. They're pointing towards that midline. I have left hip internal rotation. Left transverse pelvic girdle rotation, left hip internal rotation. And you'd be like, well, what about the right hip? Yeah, that's awesome. The right hip externally rotated, but I didn't ask you about that. So we, we, we're not disrespecting other things. I'm just respecting the specific question at hand. Oh, goodness, this question. This was a question literally from your first test. And I did this on purpose to see who adapts and who didn't. Who contacted me to ask questions about it and who didn't. There's 76 people in class, 24 people missed this question, which was the exact same question from your first test. From this position, she moves her knees away from anatomical position. What is the position and motion at her knees? Flexed and flexion. If she would be going towards anatomical, she'd have to be extending, extension. But if she goes away, she'd have to be flexing. All right, my sassy pants question. Identify the positions of the hips in this photo. Note my hands are on each side of my anterior superior iliac spine, which basically shows you that the pelvis has tilt, that the pelvis has tilt. So I have right lateral pelvic girdle rotation, so I can literally see how my, let me see if I could line it up. This is my pelvis. My right hip is abducted and my left hip is adducted. Right hip abba, left hip adda. Right hip abba, left hip adda. Given my sternum stays looking at the floor and my pelvis undergoes right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, starting from the photo above, identify the motions that must occur at the trunk and right hip. Okay, sternum, stay looking at the floor. Mr. Sternum's like, no problem, man, I got gotcha. you. 
and he stays looking at the floor. Mr. Pelvis is right here, right, looking at us. And Mr. Pelvis undergoes right transverse pelvic girdle rotation. So in other words, they're not lined up. Now they're lined up. Identify the motions that must occur at the trunk and right hip. At the trunk, you got you to look at where am I at? Well, I am right transverse trunk rotated. And then I am in anatomical position. So the only way to go from being right transverse trunk rotated to anatomical position is to have left transverse trunk rotation. The only way to go from here to home is to either spin the trunk to the left or the pelvis to the right. But from the trunk's perspective, you still spun the trunk to the left, cap and bottle. Cap and bottle, cap and bottle, cap and bottle, cap and bottle. Uh, for the right hip, you'd have right hip horizontal adduction. Horizontal adduction. It's a good example of um, frustrating verbiage. So growing up, again, you know, sprain my ankle, sprain my ankle, sprain my ankle. And when they say sprain your ankle, a lot of times, right, most of the times you have that inversion motion. And it's so entrenched in our lexicon that most of you guys just will not give it up. It's hard to give it up. Why is this important? It is important as therapists, as coaches, as athletic trainers, as doctors, for us to know that those are two separate areas. It's the two separate things. The ankle doesn't go side to side. The ankle goes up and down, right? Plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. The subtalar and transverse torsal joints go allow us to go side to side. So right ankle inversion. That should be a big red flag. Whoa, the right ankle doesn't invert. Ah, Campbell's trying to assess, like he keeps saying in the lectures, to see if I remember that inversion and eversion is not at the ankle. Going down, center of mass goes towards the ground during a squat would cause what motions at both knees and both hips? Hopefully this was a one foot putt of a question. Okay, going down, you're gonna have knee flexion and hip flexion. Going down during full sit-ups would elicit what movements from the pelvis and the hips, okay? So again, unless you understand the illusion concepts that I've been preaching at you, some people may say, well, the hips didn't move at all. Look, her femur is in the same position. Yes, it is globally, but not locally. So what I mean by that is, look at her socket, look, Mr. Pelvis, and Mr. Femur. Look at the angle of the hip here and then up there. More flexion, less flexion, away from anatomical, towards anatomical, more into a ball, less into a ball. Posterior pelvic girdle rotation because of bilateral hip extension. It looks like it's not moving, but it is. How many different planes can the pelvic girdle possibly rotate in and how many total pelvic girdle rotations exist? Three planes, sagittal, frontal, transverse, two rotations in each. So six rotations, and anterior, posterior, right lateral, left lateral, right transverse, hey, left transverse. And you may say, well, Dr. Campbell, man, we had a lot of pelvic girdle stuff. Yeah, because that's the stuff that it's the hardest to, or the hardest to, um, you know, it's easy to understand knee flexion and knee extension, ankle plantar flexion. You've had that in introductory kines classes. I know my wife has taught some of you in 360 or, 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 or maybe an intro kines class with these, with these basic joint motions. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Guys, my job is to grind it out with you at your level and how you need me to help you to get you to understand the stuff that the average person can't understand because we need you to be able to see. Guys, people that are having problems, you need to be able to see what their problem is. People that have bad posture, you're going to have to see inside their skin to see what their pelvis is doing, what their trunk is compensating with, what their scapula is doing. When you're analyzing someone's gait, when you're analyzing someone's movement, when you're working with someone in the gym on their form, you have to be able to see what most people who aren't trained in this stuff cannot see. And that's going to make you a better professional. We've got to grind it out, guys. We've got to refocus. And we have to... Adapt, improvise, and overcome. So again, I'm here to help, but I cannot help if you don't help me help you. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to literally carry you on my back and, and cross you to the finish line. But let's recap some of the ways that I'm here to help. Your grading scale, which... As proof that you watch this video all the way to the end, I would like for you to comment in the comments, what is the threshold for a C in this class? What's the threshold of a C in this class? That's one way I'm trying to help you. Another way that I'm trying to help you is 24 seven office hours. I've had students contact me at nine o'clock at night. Now I'm, an, I'm, I'm old, I usually go to bed around 9.30. But if I'm awake and available, we can talk. We can FaceTime. We can talk. We can Zoom. I don't care. I'm here to help. Will I quiz you when we're talking? Absolutely. You know why? It's not to put you on the spot. It's so that I can assess your level of understanding. So as a teacher, I can adapt and incorporate the kind of analogies that I need to help you understand. You have access to all the old lectures. Utilize them. If you're like, ah, I still don't quite understand that towards anatomical, away from anatomical, go back and rewatch that lecture. Will it take time? Yeah. Will it take a little effort? Yeah. Can it help you pass? Yeah. You know, they say that cliche, everybody's different, and it's true. You can learn the rules to poker, but to be a better poker player, you just got to play. And it's very similar. You can learn the bones and the, the motion options, but to be a clinician, to be able to see movement and positions and to be able to help people, you got to play. And one of the cool things about this content is if you're awake, you can study. If you're awake, you can practice. Anytime you're moving, you're driving in a car, you can practice. Your ankles are going up and down. Your shoulders and your radial ulna joints are moving the steering wheel. You're at home. You're cooking something. You're moving. And if you're moving, then there are joints to analyze. Another way you could practice is create flashcards. And you can say, uh, hip motion looks like it's moving, but it's not. And then do an example of that. Hip motion looks like it's not moving, and it is. Do an example of that. This is definitely not the kind of class you want to procrastinate because it's not about memorization. It's about understanding. This is definitely the kind of class you don't want to say, well, I have all the notes. I have the old tests. It's not going to change your understanding. <sighs> you have to eat the apple in little bites, guys. Don't wait till the week of the test. Some of you may wait till the day of the test, the, the day before the test. That's not the approach that I would take, especially if you're not at the grade that you wish to be at. Okay. Adapt, improvise, overcome. And I'm here to help.
I'm here to help, but I'm not here to provide. What I mean by that is I can't do the work for you. I've, I've been there. I've taken these classes. I've, I've went to college for 10 years. But I can help you, and I want to help you. Okay? All right. I hope this helps. Be well.